you, Vanessa, for this uh, introduction and thank you uh, for uh, inviting me uh, to give this uh, uh, little talk about uh, polyphonic manuscripts. Um, two warnings before uh, I start. Um, I'm afraid my um, English will sound uh, very bad after the the last uh, speaker, so please accept my apologies for my um, rather imperfect English. And secondly, I'm not a musicologist, uh, Vanessa is, so the difficult musicological questions should be addressed to Vanessa and not to me, I'm an historian, but uh, working with uh, manuscripts in collaboration with the Alamire Foundation. Um, so the golden age of Franco-Flemish polyphony uh, manuscripts at the intersection of Middle Ages and uh, Renaissance. Um, so in fact, the uh, period we are dealing with um, concerns the 15th and 16th century. And uh, for those uh, who are not really familiar uh, with the history of uh, the Low Countries, so uh, the regions of uh, the actual um, territory of Belgium, but also the northern uh, Netherlands, uh, the northern part of uh, France and the, the western part of, uh, of Germany. Um, just a small uh, introduction. Um, in fact, the Burgundian era uh, starts in our regions with the marriage in uh, 1369 of uh, Philip the Bold, uh, Duke of Burgundy. And here you see the Duchy of, uh, of Burgundy. Uh, the marriage of uh, Philip the Bold and uh, Margaret, uh, who was the daughter of the Count of Flanders, Louis de Maal, and who was also the heiress of the county of Flanders. So this marriage was far more than just um, um, a marriage between two people, but it was in fact also a marriage between a political power, uh, since uh, Philip de Bold was the son of the King of uh, France, and an economical power, because um, as you uh, probably know, the county of uh, Flanders was a very rich uh, region, thanks to uh, the um, uh, to the trade of uh, cloth uh, in the late Middle Ages. Um, uh, the county of Flanders became very wealthy. It was also an urbanized uh, region. Uh, which means uh, that um, it was uh, that there was economical potential uh, for culture. So um, artists tended to go to the places where they could buy, uh, where they could sell uh, the um, the art, and where the patrons for this art resided. And so the um, low countries. Uh, that occupied a central position in uh, Europe. Uh, the Low Countries were at the crossroads of, um, of uh, every activity in uh, Europe. Um, so those Low Countries, in those Low Countries, you ha you found these uh, patrons. You had the nobility, but there was also there were also the the rich citizens who were interested in art. And so everyone knows, uh, I think, the art of the Flemish primitives, uh, the Flemish primitives, so the painters uh, who are very famous until uh, today. So the names of uh, Jan van Eyck and uh, Rogier van der Weyden uh, probably uh, sound familiar. Uh, also, the uh, Flemish miniature painting of that period uh, is quite uh, famous, but uh, the music, um, the music isn't. In fact, uh, people today um, don't know often that often don't know that uh, music flourished also in this period, and that the 15th and 16th century were in fact the only period in uh, European European history um, when uh, where uh, the uh, composers and also the singers. 
um, uh, residing or coming from originating from the low countries that they set the tone on the European uh, musical uh, musical stage. And uh, they did this uh, thanks uh, to um, a type of music uh, that we call uh, polyphony. So what is uh, polyphony? Polyphony um, comes from, uh, oh, sorry, 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 this. Uh, polyphony comes from uh, the Greek words uh, polus and uh, phone, which means um, many voices. No, many voices in the sense of um, many uh, melodies, many parts, and not many people because uh, you can also have a monophonic uh, composition sung by a hundred people. Uh, the difference between a monophonic composition and a polyphonic composition is that in a monophonic uh, composition, uh, all the singers sing the same melody at the same time. And this isn't the case in polyphony, where you have several melodic lines, so several um, uh, several melodies, but sometimes also several texts that are combined into one composition. And the skill of um, the composers, the, uh, the Franco-Flemish composers, consists in combining all these melodies in such a way that it nevertheless sounds harmonically. The um, one of the uh, perhaps most uh, simple or most uh, familiar examples of a polyphony is uh, the canon. So uh, some of you might probably uh, know uh, Frère Jacques, um, the canon Frère Jacques. So that's in fact the same uh, principle. Uh, you have uh, one uh, melody, but the singers start singing this melody uh, at a different time. So there is one singer that starts, or a couple of singers that start the melody, and then um, others are uh, falling in and are um, uh, singing the same melody, but uh, later on. So what you here see is a page from uh, a manuscript that is actually preserved in uh, the British Library. Uh, it is the famous um, uh, manuscript with the composition uh, Summer is Ikumenin. That means um, the summer has uh, started and all the uh, animals are uh, awake. So it is not a religious uh, melody, but uh, a, a religious uh, composition, but um, a secular one uh, singing about the start of, of the summer. Uh, later on, um, this same melody has uh, been used uh, as melody for uh, a Latin uh, religious text that you see written in red uh, in the same uh, in the same manuscript. So the manuscript uh, comes from the uh, Abbey of uh, Reading and dates from the 13th century. And I will uh, let you hear um, the uh, performance by the Hilliard Ensemble. And you will see that um, the, uh, you will hear all the time um, this part of, uh, of the manuscript. So this part of the composition, Sing Cuckoo, Sing Cuckoo. That's, you will hear this all the time. And then one singer starts with Summer is Ikumenin. Then the melody will be repeated and you will hear two uh, singers singing in canon. And then the third time you will hear four of them. <laughs> Sing, 
So that was England in uh, the 13th century. Let's return to the 15th and 16th century low countries now. Um, that we know uh, so many uh, polyphonic sources of polyphonic music sources of uh, the late Middle Ages and the early Renaissance is in fact um, um, mainly due to um, the production by, um, and uh, Vanessa already mentioned him, uh, a man called Petrus Alamire. Petrus Alamire, his real name was in fact uh, Petrus Imhof, was a city, uh, citizen, citizen of the city of Nuremberg. You see here uh, an, an image of uh, Nuremberg. Um, he was a part of um, a family of uh, merchants um, residing in Nuremberg, but um, a merchant family that had a network, a trading network all over Europe. And it's probably um, um, thanks to this family and to the fact that all his family was traveling, that uh, Petrus Alamire came at a very young age to the, uh, the Netherlands. And uh, we find his uh, name for the first time in uh, the city of uh, Sertogenbos, in um, the actual uh, county of uh, Brabant, North Brabant, in the Northern Netherlands, where he was uh, inscribed as, a, where he was registered as a member of the confraternity of Our Lady. So uh, Petrus Alamir stayed in the Netherlands and started to work as a music uh, copyist. Uh, you see here, for instance, his, uh, his name uh, written in one of uh, the music manuscripts uh, that were produced by him and or his collaborators. Again, his name. Uh, the name Alamira wasn't his real name. I uh, said before that his uh, real name was uh, Petrus Imhof. And uh, Alamir was thus a pseudonym he uh, has um, he selected uh, because he really wanted uh, to uh, specialize himself in the production of music manuscripts. So he really had the intention uh, to work with music manuscripts. And so he uh, chose the name Alamire. Um, that in fact refers to uh, the music uh, theory of the, the Middle Ages. You see here what we call uh, the uh, Gidonian hand. That is a kind of didactic tool used in uh, the teaching of, uh, of music in, uh, in the Middle Ages. And it's quite a complicated system, but here you see Alla Mire. So the A, um, the A refers uh, to the pitch, and then you have the notes La Mire. 
So that's uh, the name uh, Petrus Imhof uh, cho uh, has uh, had chosen to uh, start his uh, business as a music copyist. He started that business in Sertogenbosch. Later on, he moved to Antwerp. Uh, where he worked, um, among other things, for uh, the, the cathedral. But unfortunately, nothing of his Antwerp production has been preserved. So we uh, know uh, these manuscripts existed, but we don't have these manuscripts anymore. Uh, but and later on then, after Antwerp, he moved to Mechelen. Why Mechelen? Mechelen was the city uh, where the Habsburg Burgundian court uh, resided, um, and namely uh, Margaret of Austria. Uh, so to situate Margaret of Austria, Margaret of Austria was the daughter of uh, Mary of uh, Burgundy and Maximilian of uh, Austria. Uh, she was the uh, sister of uh, Philip the Fair, um, also called the last Duke of, uh, of Burgundy, who died very young. And afterwards, she was appointed by her father to become um, the governess of, uh, of the Low Countries. She resided in Mechelen and uh, she uh, took care of the education of um, the children of her uh, brother, um, among them, of course, the most famous uh, Charles V. Um, so Petrus Alamira uh, worked uh, a lot for the uh, Burgundian Habsburg court, uh, and he produced manuscripts either for the library uh, or for the uh, chapel, mainly the chapel of, uh, of the Burgundian court in the, the Netherlands. But also, um, he produced also uh, presents uh, and um, uh, the, um, uh, the Habsburg Burgundian House commissioned uh, also gifts for um, the, uh, all the uh, wealthy, uh, all the important and uh, powerful uh, partners in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so you had uh, you find um, manuscripts produced by Petrus Alamira in uh, the Vatican Library because uh, they were sent already in the 16th century uh, to uh, the Pope. Uh, you find them in uh, in Munich. You find manuscripts in uh, Jena, but also one manuscript in the British Library that was sent to Henry VIII. Uh, so, um, uh, Petrus Alamira uh, specialized in uh, the production of these uh, luxurious uh, manuscripts uh, with uh, music and destined to a uh, wealthy uh, public for those who could afford those uh, manuscripts that didn't only contain the music, but uh, that were also uh, lavishly uh, illuminated. Um, it's because this is a production that uh, has not only a musical uh, value, but also uh, a visual value, that uh, these manuscripts were probably preserved. Because we uh, today we have uh, more than 50 manuscripts from this, what we call the workshop of uh, Petrus Alamir, um, either complete manuscripts and uh, fragments. Uh, so we say the workshop of Petrus Alamira, but in fact, we don't know if that workshop really existed. Uh, it is more likely that uh, Petrus Alamira acted as a kind of entrepreneur, that he was the one who took the commissions and to, uh, who coordinated uh, the work, uh, the production of the manuscripts, who um, uh, both uh, ordered to buy a parchment, who um, gave uh, instructions to the scribes and the illuminators, who uh, took care of the of the bindings of of the, these manuscripts, and who acted as a kind of intermediate person between uh, the, his uh, patrons and uh, the people who uh, did the real production of uh, of the manuscripts. So let's uh, have a look at these um, manuscripts of 
uh, the produced for the uh, the, the manuscript of, scripts of this uh, Alamiri corpus. So to finish uh, the, the biography, uh, I said that um, Petrus Alamiri resided in uh, Mechelen. He stayed there until his death in uh, 1536. Um, we know this because uh, of the archives of uh, Mechelen um, that mentioned that uh, Alamiri, at the end of his life, he was too old to uh, continue to work, and he received a kind of pension uh, from uh, Mary of, uh, of Hungary. And uh, after he died, um, his wife, his widow, uh, continued to, uh, to get some money for her living. She was a begin, she became a begin uh, in, uh, in Mechelen, uh, but uh, she died um, a couple of years after her husband and in the confraternity of the uh, Sertoren Bos, she was mentioned as a deceased member of the confraternity. The manuscript you see here is what we call a choir book. And a choir book means uh, that um, all the, the music for all the voices uh, is uh, noted on the same opening. Uh, so you have uh, here the first opening of the manuscript. So yeah, this is also quite um, specific for uh, manuscripts with polyphony. A manuscript with polyphony uh, generally uh, doesn't start on folio one recto, but on folio one verso, because you need an opening to note the, uh, the music for uh, the different voices. So this is what you, what you see here is um, a mass, uh, the start of a mass uh, written by uh, one of the most famous uh, Franco-Flemish composers, namely Josquin Després, uh, and he wrote uh, this mass for four voices. You see here the upper voice, then the second voice is the uh, counter tenor, then here the tenor and hear the bass voice. So you have to read a polyphonic uh, manuscript from the upper left to the lower right. So that's the way uh, it, is, uh, it is organized. And so the singers uh, stand around, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, the singers stand around, uh, a lectern uh, singing all together from uh, from one copy of uh, of the of the manuscript. So what you see here are the notes, and um, well, I will not give you an overview of medieval uh, notation, um, but um, to just to situate this in the early Middle Ages, you have a notation like this. This is what we call neumes, uh, with a notation in campo aperto. That means that you have these weird little um, signs uh, that are, however, not noted on uh, staves, but in campo aperto, in the open field. It means that uh, you have only approximative information about uh, the uh, length of the note, about the pitch, and about the rhythm. It is in the um, 11th century that Guido of uh, Arezzo uh, started with the use of, introduced the use of staves to give more precise information uh, to uh, the singers. Um, this is an um, a 16th, early 16th century manuscript with a plain chant. And you see here the staves that have been used and the notes that are, that you see here, uh, are examples of what we call square notation. Uh, that means that you know, uh, you see the, the melodies, but uh, you don't see the length of the 
notes. That comes with the notation of polyphony. This is what we call mensual notation, so indicating the, the rhythm uh, and um, also the length of uh, the notes, so the melody that has to be sung. Does this mean uh, that uh, all the problems of uh, the singers, of, of uh, contemporary singers, are resolved with this type of music notation? No, unfortunately, this is not the case, because um, when you look at these manuscripts and when uh, people, performers, try to sing from these manuscripts, uh, they uh, have several problems. First of all, uh, not everything that is um, uh, that was sung is also noted, is also uh, been written in uh, the manuscript. The scribes of these um, music uh, of these music manuscripts were uh, mostly uh, trained uh, musicians, uh, performers themselves, who knew what what and how they should sing. So they only noted what was important and to remind them of um, how the, the composition was uh, structured and organized. Moreover, you see that um, the text that is noted here, this is a Kyrie, and you see Kyrie eleison. Uh, you see the text and you see uh, the, uh, the notes, but you don't know which note corresponds to which syllable. Uh, and you see also that there are many more notes than syllables. So you, you have to put several, sing several notes or just one uh, syllable, but you don't know where exactly the uh, emphasis lays and how you should organize these notes. That's the work of interpretation, actual um, that the of interpretation that musicologists today and uh, musicians have uh, to do. So I uh, set, I explained the structure of the manuscript. So from the upper left to the lower right, this is a modern transcription of uh, a polyphonic uh, composition where you have uh, one line for uh, each uh, voice. This is uh, a transcription for uh, five voices um, composition. So this is how we uh, we sing uh, today, but in uh, the um, in the um, Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, you had this other structure with all the the music for all the voices on the same opening. And so what you see here is an image uh, of the um, Capella Pratensis. Capella Pratensis is an um, uh, an ensemble, an ensemble that is also in uh, residence at the Alamure Foundation, and they sing from original notation. And you see here all the singers standing around a lectern with, in this case, uh, um, photographs or a facsimile of uh, the original uh, manuscript. This is a detail of the same, uh, the same opening. And um, well, for many, uh, in many cases, we don't have information about, for, about the uh, patrons, about the history of uh, this manuscript, of these manuscripts. And it's often very problematic to know, uh, to get to know where they were made and um, when they were made. But in this case, the information we find in the manuscript itself is quite precise. So the uh, person uh, represented here is uh, Philip de Bolt, uh, Philip de Fer, excuse me, Philip de Fer. Uh, so the brother of Margaret of Austria and the son of Mary of Burgundy and uh, Maximilian of Austria. He is accompanied by his uh, patron saint, 
uh, Saint Philip. Then on the same page, we see his wife is uh, Joanna of uh, Castile with her um, patron saint, John the Baptist. So Joanna of Castile is later called Joanna de Metz. She is known like, uh, like this. So they are represented as the patrons of, uh, of these manuscripts on the right page of the first opening where you find many more details referring to them. So you see here, qui voudra moi tout seul. That is the motto of the motto of uh, Philip the Fair. Repeated here on the verse um, of the first folio. And then for those who would doubt uh, about have doubts about the patrons of this manuscript, you see the coat of arms, the coat of arms with the archducal uh, crown, and the combined um, the combined um, uh, the, the heraldry. So the uh, combined coat of arms of uh, Philip and of uh, Joanna. And here, so you see the little castle here on the um, on the coat of arms, referring, of course, to uh, Castile. And here on the, you have uh, this uh, this combination. These are symbols referring to the order of the Golden Fleece. So the. Uh, First image introducing the upper part, so the superior part of uh, the uh, composition, uh, is the subject of the mass. This is um, Mary and uh, Mary and child, and um, they are illustrating the mass that is called Ave Maristella. So this is the Missa Ave Maristella, a composition by uh, by Josquin Desprez. Um, the text here is um, the title of the mass is indicated in uh, red. The way uh, this red, uh, not uh, this uh, red text you see in um, many polyphonic manuscripts, has a specific meaning, since you. Um, uh, since it gives an indication about the structure of the mass and about um, the, the the basis of the of the mass, uh, in fact, a polyphonic uh, composition uh, is a quite complicated thing. And a technique that is often used is the technique of the cantus firmus. Cantus firmus is in fact the um, the the foundation of uh, of a, a polyphonic composition, where um, parts were added, so you have the uh, the foundation of uh, the melody that is the foundation of the mass, and then um, you have parts that have been added above and under. So superiors and basses, the, the foundation is mainly situated in uh, the tenor part of, of the mass. So that basis, basic melody of a polyphonic composition can be either um, a plain chant uh, melody, but also a secular melody, a song that has been used to um, to make uh, this um, this to compose this uh, poly this polyphonic music, and so you have sometimes quite weird um, quite weird titles of the mass. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the Missa mein Liefken heeft brun ogen. Um, my love has br the mass. My love has brown eyes. Uh, that is uh, quite strange because. Um, you have this combination of religious and uh, and secular um, and secular text, but in fact this is just an indication that the composer used uh, a secular music and a song, uh, a, a well known uh, song, as the, um, the the for the tenor part of uh, of the mass.
So the Missa Ave Maris, uh, Maris Stella uh, refers, uh, the title refers to the plain chant melody that has been used and to which uh, several uh, melodies have been uh, added. And so here you see again the uh, Capella Pratensis, and I will let you hear uh, their performance or small part of their performance of the Kyrie, so first part of this Missa Ave Maris Stella. So we already know who uh, the names of the of the patrons. Um, the uh, further in the uh, manuscript, we find supplementary uh, indications uh, about that give of the, that help us to uh, date this uh, manuscript. Uh, so here you see um, the um, uh, Kyrie of uh, that is marks the beginning of uh, another mass, the Missa Philippus Rex Castilie. Now, in, in fact, written by, and then here you see the name Josquin, again, Josquin de Pré. Uh, in fact, uh, Josquin de Pré never wrote uh, Missa Philippus Rex Castilie, but the melody of this mass is very well known. It is, in fact, the Missa uh, Hercules Dux Ferrarie, so a mass Josquin wrote uh, for uh, Hercule d'Este, Duke of uh, Ferrara, and uh, for this manuscript, the name of uh, Hercule d'Este, Hercules Dux Ferrarie, has been uh, replaced by Philippus Rex Castilie. So the fact that he calls himself uh, Rex Castilie indicates that the manuscript um, has been uh, written after 1504. Uh, that the moment on which uh, Philip's uh, mother-in-law, so the uh, mother of uh, Joanna of Castile, Isabella of Castile, died. And so then he um, uh, pretended uh, to uh, become, he wanted to become, um, to recuperate the heritage of his wife and to, he called himself Rex uh, of Castile, although he never became, uh, became king because he died himself also in uh, 1506. So we know that this manuscript must have been written between 1504 and 1506. Another manuscript um, that hasn't been uh, made for the Burgundian Habsburg uh, court, but uh, rather for um, um, uh, someone uh, who, uh, whose name we know, it's uh, uh, Charles Leclerc, uh, someone who was attached to the court. He uh, occupied administrative uh, positions at the court and he ordered this manuscript that is uh, devoted to um, the um, seven sorrows of um, Mary, of Our Lady. So meaning, uh, this is a quite popular uh, theme in uh, also in literature and art. So the seven moments of um, that uh, Mary experience in her life. So here you see the miniature with Mary and seven swords uh, representing or referring to the seven sorrows. 
And here you see the name of the composer, Matthäus Pipelare. You see, this is a rebus. Re rebus. Um, the name isn't uh, written. Um, you don't have uh, the, um, the name written, but you have here Pipe and then the notes La and Re. So representing the name. And then you have Matthäus Pipelare. Pio Memoriae, meaning that uh, this manuscript was made after the death of Matthäus Pipelare. And then here you see the Cantus Firmus of this mass, uh, also written uh, in the tenor part, uh, Numquam Fuit Pena Maior. This is in fact a uh, Spanish song that was quite famous and that served as Cantus Firmus, so the foundation of this mass. Here you see a um, uh, painting by uh, Bernard van uh, Orlé, uh, who also had close connections with the court of uh, Margaret of Austria and representing here the uh, seven sorrows of the Virgin. Uh, here you have uh, Margaret of Austria herself. Uh, she uh, ordered several manuscripts from the workshop of uh, Petrus Alamire. And one of these manuscripts is her personal songbook. Um, and you see here again uh, the start of the songbook. The songbook is in fact uh, contains mostly secular music, but some religious compositions as well. And it's Often the case that um, even uh, chansonniers, because this is a chansonnier, so a work with songs, that a chansonnier often um, starts with a religious composition. You see here again uh, Mary, it's uh, Avi Sanctissima Maria. You see here Margaret of Austria praying to Mary, and here uh, her count, uh, her coat of arms. In the middle of this manuscript, you find this uh, rather uh, weird uh, pages. You see that the style is completely different from what we have seen before. Um, so what we, do we see here? We see notation in black, entirely black notation, whereas you normally have white and black notes. Here, everything is written in uh, black. Um, it is, in fact, uh, also a um, uh, kind of um, testimony of the personal life of, uh, of Margaret of Austria, because this is a composition that has been added and has, has been um, uh, written for the, to comm commemorate the death of her father, Maximilian of Austria. So the black notes are a sign of mourning. Um, you might think, if you look at uh, this uh, manuscript, that this is a um, composition for four, uh, for four voices. So one, two, three, four. But in fact, it's far more complicated than that because you have this information that has been added. Here you see the word canon, and then you see Celum terra mariaque sucurite pio. Heaven, earth, and the sea um, come the pious, uh, uh, come and help the pious man. So the, ref the, ref uh, the reference to the heaven, earth, and the sea, that's in fact a kind of code to indicate that there are three more voices that should be added to this composition. Shelum is the upper voice, Terra a tenor voice, and Maria the sea, so the lower voice. So you have in fact here three voices singing in canon and then four other voices. So this is in fact a seven voices. Uh, a seven voices composition. This is one of the Alamira manuscripts that have been heavily 
damaged. So this is one uh, uh, manuscript preserved in KBR, and you see that the miniatures have been cut out in a rather rude way. And also here on this page, several things are going on. Um, so you have uh, several voices that should sing, but that uh, shouldn't always sing. This is a Benedictus, uh, so part of, uh, of the credo. Uh, and uh, here you have in red notation, Benedictus non venit. That means there's a kind of, um, of joke um, Benedictus is, of course, the, the name of the, the, the beginning words of the composition, uh, but is also a personal name. It's also the name of a man. So here the scribe has uh, mentioned Benedictus non venit. Uh, Benedict doesn't come, uh, indicating that, that that voice should at a certain moment keep silent. And for those who don't understand this, uh, he has had it here. He has had added here in red, in do, nomine domini taci, in the name of God. Shut up. Showing you another manuscript, not from the uh, workshop of uh, Petrus Alamire. This is um, the uh, the bass dance manuscript of Margaret of Austria. Uh, so um, uh, polyphony isn't always about uh, singing but uh, also about instrumental music and even of dance. So we have this manuscript in our collections. It's a manuscript on black parchment with gold and uh, silver ink and is presented uh, like this. What you see here are the notes for the, uh, this, the music. This is uh, the music that is played mainly by instrumentalists, but um, might, uh, it might be possible that there was also some singing as, uh, as well. You have then here the title, uh, the title of um, the composition, La Marguerite, and the number of notes. And what you see here, these, uh, these characters, are in fact the choreographic instructions for the dancers. A quite uh, recent um, uh, discovery of polyphony, um, not from the workshop of Alamire either, but is the Leuven Chansonnier. Leuven Chansonnier has been discovered very recently, only in 2016. It has been bought in by the um, King Baudouin Foundation and is now in a, a permanent loan at the Alamire Foundation. It is, in fact, a, a quite spectacular discovery because it contains uh, 50 uh, songs of which 12 were completely unknown. Um, except for the first composition that is a motet, so a religious composition, all the, um, the songs are secular music. Uh, interesting not only for the music, but also for the texts, because the texts of many of these compositions were not known. So this is newly discovered uh, poetry. Just a very quick impression.
we um, we have seen until now only what we call a choir book, so meaning that um, all the um, uh, the voices are uh, the, the music for all the voices uh, is noted on the same opening. There is also another type of polyphonic uh, manuscripts, and uh, that's um, these are called part books. That means that uh, every voice has its own little booklet uh, to sing. Uh, mainly uh, these um, part books uh, contain uh, secular music and are not used in, uh, in masses, uh, for instance. Uh, this is one of um, the manuscripts from the collection of uh, KBR. So this is a part book. Also beautifully uh, illuminated. Uh, this is quite a strange, um, a strange uh, page because it gives indication about the um, the production of uh, this page. So uh, normally you should expect that um, the illustrations were added uh, after the writing of both the text and the music. But here the fact that the music is noted upon the, um, the miniature um, learns us that in this case they proceeded in a, an, a, another way. So to uh, study uh, these uh, manuscripts, um, it's quite complicated, um, a complicated issue. Um, so we work with the uh, Alemire Foundation, um, foundation that is digitizing uh, polyphonic as well as monophonic uh, music. They have their own um, laboratory, uh, a mobile laboratory, and so they are actually, um, today, they are uh, working, uh, literally working today in uh, KBR. So they are uh, traveling uh, to collect this polyphonic uh, and this uh, monophonic music, uh, but also uh, plain chant. So and um, um, printed music all over the world. Um, results, if you want to have a look at these manuscripts, at the digit, digitized manuscripts, you can um, you can go, of course, to the websites of the uh, concerned, uh, concerned libraries, uh, including the website of uh, KBR, so the catalog of KB KBR, but the Alamira Foundation has also its uh, own integrated database for early music. And uh, they are also conducting um, uh, acoustic research because studying polyphonic music um, is, an, um, is a quite multidisciplinary uh, business. Um, it's... Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a quite um, multidisciplinary issue. There are lots of things we don't know. So it's, it's necessary to put uh, this music in a context. And that means that um, it's necessary to do a historical research, art historical research, to have a look at these manuscripts but also to study the acoustics um, in uh, which the, uh, the music was performed. And so here you see measurements in uh, going on in um, the um, uh, chapel of the Royal Library, so the Nassau Chapel of the Royal Library that is integrated in our uh, museum. Um, for those who wanted to know more about, for instance, Petrus Alamira or the manuscript of the Bas Dance, there is also the, um, the website of the Alamira Foundation where you find uh, several documentaries. And that's again the uh, Nassau Chapel. The Nassau Chapel is now part of the KBR Museum already mentioned uh, by uh, Vanessa, uh, where we will, um, where we just want to give uh, this um, 
uh, this idea of the cultural, intellectual and artistic life in the southern um, low countries in the 15th and 16th century and to which we will now in the coming year at this uh, uh, polyphonic uh, layer so that um, we hope that the museum will not only be a visual but will also become um, an, um, a sounding uh, experience for visitors and you are all invited uh, to come and visit the museum.